so for today for the art club um i chose one of the packages that uh, we highlighted two weeks ago uh as part of the new black and the 3.12 release um so the one i chose is the nebulosa package um, um let me open that link here um so there's a couple of packages here to install um, to try to get things going. Um, um, and um, looking at the vignette, I realized that the vignette for Nebulosa highlights actually several of the main steps for um, processing a single cell or single nucleus data uh, with the bioconductor packages. Um, and so it's really like following the um, the set of tools recommended by the orchestrating single cell analysis with Bioconductor book. Um, so um, I thought that's like uh, a very quick but still good intro to uh, to these packages. And so we'll um, we'll start to get familiarized with them, with the names and the functions um, of the packages uh, for those steps. Um, and that's because um, um, I've been talking with um, Kerry Martinovich about um, having a boot camp for single cell or single nucleus uh, RNA seq data processing uh, based on, on that um, book, um, the orchestrating single cell analysis with my conductor book. Um, so, this is like a quick intro for that. Um, uh, okay. So, I'm just gonna open, well, at this point actually, like uh, the, the, the package for Nebulosa, well, let me show it just for the video, I guess. Um, so what is Nebulosa here? So it says here the title of it, or the, the single cell data visualization using kernel gene weighted density estimation. So there's a lot of uh, words here, <laughs> like keywords. But the idea is really um, this package is going to do um, a type of density plot. Um, so we're going to have like a, 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 a two dimension density plot um, uh, for looking at the distribution of data. Um, um, but the idea is that here, the data that we're looking at is typically single cell data. And uh, the way you normally visualize single cell data is either with UMAP or TSD plots. Um, so it's really like gonna be like a package for making a slightly different version of TSD or UMAP plots or like even PC plots. Um, and uh, Jose Alquisir Hernandez, he studied the same undergrad I did in Mexico and he visited in Baltimore in 2015. Um, and now he's in Australia. So I've known him for a while. Um, and I think, um, as so I first found out about this package through Twitter. Now this package here um, has two vignettes. Um, we're gonna focus on the first one, which is the one using the workflow from the orchestrating single cell analysis with Bioconductor book. Um, but I see that they have another vignette in case you use the Surat package. Um, so this vignette over here, um, you can either like open the HTML or open the R script. Um, um, like if you open the, open the HTML, we can look at it. Uh, but I think it's maybe best if you download the R script or alternatively, uh, we can find here the GitHub link for the package, which will open it in a new tab. Um, and then inside of the github repository for the package we go to vignettes um uh, the one that i want us to look at is this introduction .rmd vignette. so uh what i did actually was like i selected all the code um, and then um pasted it into my r studio window which is what i have here on the right side um, um Okay, so because you might, you might want to look, uh, run some of these commands, um, and you install these packages um, using the code I I put here uh, for installing all these packages. Um, 
you'll be able to then load them all, et cetera. Um, and a lot of these packages um, are worth installing anyway, if because um, uh, they're all related to uh, processing uh, single cell, single nucleus data. And we actually use um, these two also for the spatial data, um, scatter and scram. Right. So, uh, so I, I put here the link directly to that RMD file. Um, but you could also maybe just, if you don't want the, the, the text explaining the R commands, you can also just um, access directly the, the R script for the code. Um, so I actually like downloaded, like, downloaded it and rendered the vignette on my computer um, prior to this, uh, just to make sure that everything would run. Um, um, so let's look a little bit at what this is doing. Oh, yeah. um, so we before we get to the nebulosa part, let me see if I can zoom in. Before we can get to the nebulosa section, uh, we're going to learn a little bit about data processing uh, for 10x genomic single uh, cell or single nucleus data. Uh, so here we're going to use a public data set. <clears throat> Um, uh, and we're going to use a very small one. So <clears throat> this data set is stored uh, on S3 um, and is this PBMC3K data set, um, which is one of the example data sets that like 10 Genomics has on the website. Um, and so if we use a BIOC file cache, the package, that's going to allow us to, um, um, to download the data once in our computers. And in the future, if we have to download the data again. R will detect that, like, oh, you already have the data. You don't need to download it. Let's just reuse the data you have. So I want to run that code myself on the right side. Um, let me make this smaller. Um, uh, OK. Uh, maybe this is too big. Mm -hmm. right. So, oh, let me, I need to load all the packages. Nebulosa, Skater, Scram, Droplet Util, Spicy, File Cache. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> let me actually load. Um, just run these BIOC file cache with the default arguments. So what this does is that it sets up um, an R object where, um, depending on your computer, is going to download the data to um, to a location uh, controlled by this BIOC file cache package. Um, so <clears throat> once we have our like BIOC file cache package. Uh, um, BIOC file cache set up in our computer. We can then say like, okay, we want to download this specific URL. Um, um, so if I look here, data file, what it looks, it, it points to is like a specific location in my computer where BIOC file cache downloaded that file, PMC3 filter gene matrices it added here an ID for it. So it controls where it is. Uh, but that is actually a tar file. So we can use the ontar command to ontar that file. And now, now that we have that, then we can use this function called read, read 10 x counts, which is from the droplet utils package in Bioconductor. Um, and so this package allows us to read in um, uh, the count files from, from um, uh, that particular data set. Um, let's look at PMB, PBMC, our object. And so what it actually even does is it, it, it provides back a single cell experiment object, um, which is similar to the ones that we've used for summarize experiment. Um, single cell experiment is a package that expands the, the summarize experiment class. Um, so it has a lot of things that we're familiar with already. 
but it has new things, uh, including like this um, alternative experiment names and reduced in names that right now our object doesn't have any. Um, and that's because some of those, uh, particularly the reduced dim names, those are uh, things we'll generate right now through the data processing. Um, so something here is that uh, uh, we need unique uh, gene names. So there's a function here, here called uh, uniquify feature names. Um, and so here this, this function is gonna make uh, unique um, row names for our data based on either the the gene ID and the symbol information. So if we look at um, row data of PBMC, uh, here we have the symbol gene ID on, under the ID column and the gene symbol under, I mean, the symbol column. The row names here are the, are the um, symbol gene IDs right now. But if I run this uh, unique five uh, names, um, let's look at it again. Um, so now we made it such that it's going to use the, the symbol as the name, but, um, as you might know, uh, there's several genes that have the same symbol, but different gene IDs. So some of them will be like longer IDs. Um, anyway, this is just for making everything unique. Um, but it also maybe, um, uh, nicer for the plots because maybe maybe it's going to use that information on the plots. Um, so we just have our data now in R. Um, so let's start doing some of the quality control steps. So here, um, something that you, you might want to do when you're working with uh, single cell data is you might just want to look at genes that have enough um, um, measurements across your data set. So let's look at what are the dimensions of our data set, P, P, and C. So here we have uh, 32,000 genes across 20, 2,700 uh, cells right now. Um, um, and one very low filter here is like, okay, let's just check if they're expressed in at least three out of our 2,700 samples. So that is, um, uh, that is a 0.11% of the samples. Um, so we'll use this row sums function applied to the counts. Um, and so we'll say like, okay, does, does it have a list, uh, you know, does it have an expression greater than four? Let's look at that. And this table is expressed. Um, so actually, only 13,000 out of um, oh, I always make this mistake and the dot when it doesn't have a dot. Uh, so 13,000 out of the 32,000 genes um, are actually expressed in three or more cells. Um, and so this will happen a lot with a single cell or single nucleus data because it's a very sparse type of data. There's a lot of zeros. So once we do that, we can just filter the rows um, using the, the single bracket um, syntax. And so let's look at the dimensions of PBMC. Uh, and now we have 13,000 genes across 20, uh, 2,700 cells. So, uh, that is typically like, you know, we do something similar when we're working with bulk RNA-seq, we're filtering the rows. Now <clears throat> we're filtering the genes uh, based on like some uh, expression filter. But uh, when we're working with single cell data or single nucleus data, there's also um, um, steps for um, identifying cells that are low of low quality. Um, um, and so we're gonna run some of those functions here and they, they're implementing in the scatter package. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, um, oh, sorry, I skipped something too. Um, so we can use functions from the scatter package to, to compute this quality cell metrics. 
But even before that, we could also just um, drop um, cells that have a very low unique number, a very low number of UMIs. UMI stands for unique molecular identifier. Um, and so if, if we don't have at least, let's say 200 transcripts expressed in that cell, 200 unique transcripts, we might not actually care about that cell. So, um, and so here we're gonna do like a, a, a similar filter for now we're like computing the column sums um, across all the genes. Um, the very first filter, like just removing genes is like the faster one um, 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 to compute. Let's now do the column sums. And so let's check how many are expressed. Um, so actually here, all of them um, um, have at least 200 genes um, expressed. Um, so this filter is not really doing anything. Um, um, in this particular case, but we started working with a filter data set to begin with. Um, if you see here, the name of the, of the file says filter gene. So we're already, <laughs> this has already been like, in a sense, like quality control. Um, but that will be one of the steps we would do on a real like single cell nucleus uh, analysis. The next thing is like, um, um, for the function here, per cell QC metrics, which is stands for per cell quality control metrics, we need to know which are the genes that are mitochondrial genes. Um, and so uh, you can look at uh, uh, we could look at the specific genes and then see which of them are in the chromosome uh, MT. However, this particular object that we have doesn't have that information. Uh, so we could always like um, work with um, an annotation database and find like the gene coordinates for all the genes. Or in this particular scenario, uh, and you'll see this also on the, on the orchestrated single cell analysis with my conductor book, um, we're, they're going to rely on just filtering by the name of the gene. So uh, genes that start with MP and a dash are mitochondrial genes um, most of the time, although I like to double check that. Um, so let's look at the row names PMBC where we have that pattern. Um, and so like all of these genes um, are mitochondrial genes. Um, uh, the dash is important because if you don't include the dash, you're going to include an other set of genes that are actually not mitochondrial genes. Why do we do this? Because we want to know how much expression there is on the mitochondrial chromosome um, uh, as one of the metrics. Um, and so you'll see here on the syntax for the function per cell quality metrics that we're going to provide here a subset called mito for the mitochondrial. And that's where we're going to provide this logical vector that identifies which are the genes that are mitochondrial genes. Um, so let me run that. Um, uh, this was pretty fast right now because it's we're working with a small data set. But with like bigger data sets, it can take a couple, like between 30 seconds and maybe two minutes, something like that. Um, um, depending how big your data set is. Um, so that will compute some metrics for us. Um, uh, but to actually like be able to interpret them and make decisions, uh, there's this function called quick per cell quality control, um, where we provide those quality metrics that we have. And what this function will do is that it's going to try to find, find identifier, uh, sorry, it's going to try to find outlier cells. Uh, based on information that we want to filter here. So we could, for example, find out, uh, outlier cells based on the mitochondrial percent. This is something that is a bit tricky because um, sometimes the mitochondrial, um, the percent of reads that are assigned to the mitochondrial is um, um, actually a biological feature, not a technical one. If the cells that you're looking at if you have a subset of cells, for example, that are highly active compared to the rest, 
um, of the cells that you're studying because an active cell needs a lot more energy and so it's going to have more uh, it will it will typically have more uh, copies of the mitochondria um, so let's run that uh, and um, you know uh, there's actually um, uh, the the book here the uh, Oscar book um, it's pretty good. We'll we'll see it at some point in the boot camp. Um, but there's uh, some scenarios that uh, like you need to be more careful for. Uh, um, so the basic what I'm trying to say is that uh, you can't just like take this quality control code and assume this is going to work for your data set, right? Every data set is a bit different, so you need to also like make a lot of plots and things like that. Um, but right now, this is just um, on our way to to the nebulosa. Um, utilities. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, um, here, um, uh, they're going to do a little bit of different, uh, normalization. So instead of using the, um, the log, um, some of the other functions that are already implemented for calculating the log normalized counts. Here, they're, what they're going to do is like, we're going to take all the counts that we have, divide them by the total that we have, uh, but then um, multiply by 10 to, 10 to the fourth. Um, so um, I haven't seen that before, but um, 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 we'll just run that for now. Uh, so now we have some normalized counts. We can then um, compare the gene and um, the gene mean versus the gene variance, um, which is the type of plot that Lima does for the bulk RNA seq uh, differential expression analysis. Um, and why do we want that? Because we want to find the genes that are the most variable genes. Um, and so this model gene var function from the scram package will like run that efficiently for us. Um, 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 a lot of things here change between bulk and single cell data sets because single cell is a lot bigger in dimensions. And so you start then to have to use uh, functions that are um, um, uh, coded in a way that they can deal with like big memory objects um, 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 uh, or not necessarily even big memory objects. They, they would be really big in memory, but they might be not represented in memory for R. Um, uh, so this is something like, like Nick Eagles has been paying attention to because it's the same type of uh, infrastructure packages that are used for the WGBS data. Um, um, so that's why like we need to learn like a full new set of functions compared to the bulk RNA-seq. Um, so now that we have modeled that variance, um, I, on the OSCA book, there's like uh, plots we would make at this point, but here we can then just run this get top. HDG stands for highly variable genes. Um, so we wanna get the um, just the top variable genes. Here we're gonna get the top 3000 um, why would you want to do something like this? That's because the next step that we're going to run, computing the PCs, uh, is very um, resource intensive if you use all of your genes. Right now, like um, TMDC, we have um, 2,700 cells, right? Um, in some of our data sets, we might have like 40,000 cells, right? Or, or like even more than that. Um, and if you run, if you want to run a, a, a PCA um, on a, on a lot of samples or a lot of cells um, across, you know, thirteen thousand genes or something, that will take quite a bit of time. So instead of doing it across all thirteen thousand genes or something, uh, we can just do it across uh, a subset of them. And by selecting the most variable genes, uh, instead of just doing a random selection of genes we're basically going to get very, very similar results um, in our PC analysis. Um, so PCA here is, uh, is not a deterministic 
uh, algorithm. So if you want to, if you want your results to be reproducible, you need to set the seed before. So here we're going to use the, you know, set seed 66. I mean, that's the one they chose. Um, and so we'll run then uh, PCA. So this will take a little bit here. Um, you saw that it, like it ran fairly fast. Um, for some like of the special data that I ran, I think it would take maybe, um, I think some of these steps could take hours um, to run. Um, um, so we're gonna run this PCA function. Uh, you'll notice here that when we're running PCA, uh, we're uh, providing as input the PVMC object that we have and we, we're resigning it at the end. Why do we wanna do that? Because a lot of the functions is Cater and, and Scran, um, they return single cell experiment objects. So let, let's expect our object a little bit. What change here? So we still have 13,000 genes across 2,700 um, cells. We previously added the log counts manually. The row data is still the same. Uh, but what did change here is now we have under the reduced name slot, we have something new called PCA. So that's where we actually have uh, um, um, PB, uh, I made a type of PBMC. Uh, so under that slot, well, I should have printed all of it. Uh, what we have now here is a matrix with one row per the top 3,000 genes. Sorry, mm, is it a, mm, let me go make sure I'm not saying something wrong. Um, sorry, one row per each of the 2,700 cells. Um, and we have 50 PCs right now. That's a default for run PCA. Um, for larger data sets and stuff, you might actually want to include more PCs. Uh, so unlike bulk RNA-seq, with a single cell, we want to include as many, um, a lot of more PCs to explore um, small effects. And that's because you might have like, let's say out of our 2,700 cells, we might just have 10 cells that are a unique cell type. Um, and so we still want to be able to find those later on. Um, once we have a, a com computed uh, PCs, we can then run UMAP or TSNE. Um, and so here, when we when we run the uh, UMAP, we have to say like, okay, what are the PCs that we want to use for? So that's where we're using the name PCA. That's because when we run run PCA, we might actually we could actually run it more than once with different number of PCs and have uh, different um, um, PCA matrices inside of our single cell object. Uh, so let's run that. And you'll notice that we're uh, reassigning it to the same object. Uh, so again, this takes a bit of time to compute. Um, in this case, this is an example data set, so it'll run fairly fast. Um, um, that is uh, you know, kind of small. Um, and if I print the object again, we'll notice on the reduced DIN names that we have now something new called UMAP. So I can look at um, the dimensions of UMAP. Um, and now here we have a small matrix with 2,700 rows, one per each of our cells. And now we only have two columns. And that's because by default with UMAP, we're reducing uh, all our data to just, um, two dimensions. Why do we want only two dimensions? Because we want to be able to visualize it type of thing. Um, um, and that's, you know, we're, we're nearly at the point where we can use nebulosa. Uh, at this point though, we haven't done any clustering. So we're going to use this function build SNN graph from, um, from Scran. What is, what is SNN stand, standing for? That stands for shared nearest neighbors. Uh, so we need to first here build a graph. You'll notice that there's a K parameter that's set to 10. That is the number of neighbors that we want to look at. So here we're going to like build this graph based on looking at one cell and 10 of its neighbors at a time. This will actually take a while to run on a, on a, on a 
true data set. Um, 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 but now that we have the graph, the this representation, we need to we need to uh, find actually groups of cells um, that are uh, the clusters really. And so for that, we're going to use this iGraph um, function. So let me see if we actually if I have this iGraph installed. I do. Right now, it just ran in in this in this in Continuously, um, but again, with a real data set, this will take a while to run. And so, let, let's look at this uh, class object. Uh, so, if you you'll notice here, it's just numbers. It's just a it's just a, a numeric vector. Uh, and if I make the table here, it found eight different clusters of cells for us. And the number of cells per cluster varies between, let me sort this, uh, between 109 cells per cluster up to 589. Um, so that, okay, that seems reasonable. Um, 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 Although I'd like at, at some point here, like the bio biological knowledge that you might have for that particular data uh, will become important, right? Because you might, if you find, for example, um, a cluster of cells that is really, really small, then that could be something weird, right? That could be like a technical artifact. Um, and so you might need to go back to the quality control steps that we did before and see why are those different um, and if you need to filter them out. So there's a lot of back and forth in a real analysis at this point where you're you know, trying to make sure that your clustering results are looking okay. Um, for plotting purposes, we're gonna make them into um, a factor uh, and we'll assign them here under the call labels function, which this is actually new to me, um, PBMC. Uh, I didn't know that there was a call labels lot. Um, uh, oh, I see here, it, it gets assigned under call data, uh, PBMC. Um, so has a sample barcode and now it has a label there. Um, okay, so <clears throat> uh, I, let me make what will be the, the typical plot that you would make instead of, uh, um, instead of nebulosa. At this point, you might use the function plot reduce name, PBMC, uh, and we'll use, for example, we can plot, for example, the PCs. Um, I'll, be, I'll make this bigger. Um, um, actually, let me, yeah, let me make this big again. Uh, let me open also the help file for plot reduce name. Um, so here, plot reduce them has a lot of things. Let me go to one of the examples uh, because you want to find like okay, the syntax color by. Uh, okay. Color by equals, and we can give it a name of a variable in the call data. For object, and I just saw that the name was here label. Uh, so let me do that again. Um, and uh, let's zoom in into this plot, make it big. And so here we have PC1 versus PC2. By default, with like um, some default colors for the clusters. Uh, in a different meaning today, we were, uh, so you we were talking that you know, default colors are not the best. So you know, there's ways of of updating the colors here, and um, and let me actually show you that uh, if I save this into let's say P, um, what is the type of object here? It's actually a ggplot object. So like we could even use like plotly uh, um, ggplotly P and make an interactive version. Um, of this PC plot, right? Um, uh, cool. 
and because it's a at this point then you can also like uh, also like say like p plus g plot two let's say uh, theme bw right you can change the theme for example of the plot things like that right uh, or the colors you could always at, at this point you could update the colors manually so i've done a lot of tinkering uh with, with the resulting plots from plot, plot reduce them uh just like i plotted the pcs though we could also plot the umap results um although let me add the color by here uh, label let's zoom in and so <clears throat> what is the problem with this type of plot um so here we have uh, umap one versus umap two um and so we we're plotting 2700 points right um <clears throat> now 2700 points is not that many yet right um uh, but let, imagine you were plotting 40,000 or 100,000 points. That's quite a bit of points to plot. It takes a while to make the plot. And you have that many points. Um, you could use alpha blending. You could use uh, some of that, but you're going to have other plotting. And why, will, why is other plotting a problem here? Well, other plotting is a problem because like, let me use the zoom and patient features um, if I can find them. Uh, okay. Over plotting is a problem. Let me change the color because you won't see this. Uh, I'll use black for regions like this, right? I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually here orange, pink, and red points. Um, and it's kind of hard to see like how many of the pink points are actually in this area, right? How many of the pink points are there? Um, um, Lord, like, I don't know if you noticed, there's actually like a little pink point over here, right? Um, um, and so <clears throat> this can become a problem because people are going to try to interpret these plots and say like, oh, actually, like, you know, the clusters that we got look fairly separated on this UMAP plot because we have like the blue points, the red, the orange, the pink, the brown, the purple, and the green, right? They're all separate. Um, uh, however, the truth might be that, like, actually, maybe these pink ones are like all over the place, right? And it's hard, hard to know, like, where do they go, right? I think I see a little pink point over here. Uh, uh, um, so you could use, like, uh, Plotly, for example, um, and then mouse over each of the points, right? Um, that's something you could do. That's one option. Um, but another option is to use this new package. So now we're finally at the nebulosa section. So uh, let me uh, go back to the vignette and read a little bit of the text here. Um, so here it says like nebulosa really, the main function you want to use from nebulosa is this plot density function. And we can see that it's going to take as input our um, uh, single cell experiment object. Uh, and it's going to take a name, a row name. So here, uh, uh, we change the, the names to be gene symbols. Um, so we can look at, for example, the gene CD4. Uh, so let's do that. Um, Um, actually, let me try to, um, before I do that, let's try to color, the, uh, let's do the default, uh, um, let me do color by CD4 here with plot reduce them. Oh, yeah. Just so we can compare uh, to what Nimbolos is going to do for us. Um, So this is the default plot reduce them. Um, and uh, we have, let me use the annotation. We have, we're using the Veritas color scale, which is colorblind friendly. That goes from um, uh, dark blue to bright yellow. Um, 
And you'll notice here that, uh, well, I, I mean, I see some bright points on, on this cloud of points over there. I see some bright uh, points over here, but they're like definitely overplotted, right? And this is even harder than the, than, the, than visualizing the cell clusters because um, uh, it's hard to like see, you know, much of the data. And so let's now use this plot uh, uh, on the score density function from um, from Nebulosa. Um, I got a couple warnings. Let's look at it again. Um, so <clears throat> a couple of things changed now. Let me annotate. The first thing to notice is the is the legend change. Instead of being counts or log counts, now we have a density. It's still using the Veritas color scale that goes from dark uh, blue being low to bright yellow being high. Um, um, but um, but it's no longer counts. And so what is this doing? This is like showing us like uh, um, in a way is like doing this density. Um, um, it's, it's computing the density of the data, and it's doing it in, in a in like a localized way, such that now we see that there's a cloud of of um, bright, brighter points over here, and it diffuses and it becomes mostly mostly dark right over there in these regions. Um, let me move the zoom window. And this cluster, this cluster over here is mostly bright and then a little bit uh, dark. So now we can actually see more clearly uh, that um, there's a more expression of CD4 in these two sets of cells. Um, if we go back to the cluster plot that we made before, um, where I was clustering by label, that we can see that that corresponds to um, the green cluster, which is number three, and part of the orange, part of the red clusters, which are three and uh, sorry, four and two. Um, um, so uh, that is pretty neat. Um, so basically, it's allowing us to see more data. Um, <clears throat> um, which, if we go back to the to the regular uh, functions from Skater, uh, plot reduce dim, uh, or also plot umap, which is a shortcut for plot reduce dim, um, we you know we don't actually see much um, compared to our, uh, the new Nebulosa plot. Um, so here, really, Nebulosa is, is moving the data. Um, um, and we're able to see more clearly the pattern here of the CD4 expression in those cells. Um, <clears throat> that is um, uh, the main feature of Nebulosa. There's a couple more, thing more things. Um, we can, for example, here say plot density and give it more than one gene name. So here we can say like CD8 and CCR7, which um, I don't really know much about these genes. But, um, um, let's run it. Um, and so if I just paint P, print P3, uh, I get them side to side. You can then also say like plus um, plot layout and number of columns equals one. Um, and so if I do that now, I get them um, um, one on top of the other type of thing. Um, this is just really for presentation purposes. Uh, I believe this is using plot layout. I'm going to bet that this is from uh, the cow plot package. I don't know, it's actually the patchwork. Oops, I should have. Um, uh, uh, patchwork is a package that we, we recently uh, uh, saw in one of our, our club sessions. Um, all right. Um, so it actually is <laughs> nicely ties in together. Um, 
cool. Um, let me go back to the vignette. Um, so here, right, we, I mean, uh, these two genes, they have different patterns that uh, we can see clearly with these plots that maybe we like the base plots we wouldn't actually be able to notice. Um, but those are, it's kind of like just repeating it one after the other. There's this uh, function here, uh, sorry, this option called uh, joint equals true. If we do it though, now we're going to get like, um, we're going to estimate the density of them together. So we get a third uh, plot, which is a CD8 plus the CCR7. So we can actually ask when are these two genes correlate, um, co expressed? Uh, in what cells are they co expressed? And what is the density of that co expression? Um, and so that's what we can see here. And so initially, we just had CD8 over here on the top. We see like a, a bright spot over in the middle of this cloud of points and on the right side. For CCR7, it's mostly on the right side. Now that we did them together, we see that it's really just on the right side where they're co-expressed. Um, and so all of this um, can be useful for um, interpreting the data. Um, um, for uh, uh, actually labeling what are these cluster of cells, right? So we saw that this cloud of points was the red cluster mostly. Um, and so based on this information, maybe now we can say uh, um, that this cluster of cells is like CD8 A positive, CCR7 positive. I don't actually know what those genes are, but let's say that those are marker genes for um, microglia cells or some type of cells, right? Then we, then we can label them as something. Here they're saying they're, they're naive TD8 T cells, uh, but that's um, um, you know I don't I don't really know much about about this data set. Um, um, cool. So that like we see here that corresponds to that cluster number four that uh, I may, I showed you before with the plot reduced then. Um, what else can we do here? Let's see. Uh, uh, I guess here, uh, combine equals false. This is maybe more programmatic. You just, um, uh, just want that last one, maybe. Um, uh, so I guess this is just changing the type of object that plot density will give you back. But like we saw on the patchwork session, there's always ways of extracting like a specific plot out of a, a, a patchwork uh, layout. Um, cool. Um, so that's basically it. That's um, uh, this Nimbolosa package. Uh, I'm, I think there's a preprint. Uh, no, I know that there's a preprint because I, I saw it on Twitter. I haven't read it, but like that probably will explain more about what is the statistical method is, that is being used uh, for this density estimation. Um, uh, um, but from a practical point of view, I think like this is a great package. We should definitely use it uh, for visualizing data. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be single cell or single, single nucleus data. We could also use it for our spatial data um, 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 or really anything that is like a single cell experiment object. Um, um, cool. So let me stop recording and see if you have any questions.